you guessed that. Okay, uh, so thank you. Um, I haven't prepared too many slides, so I'll, I'll have time if you have any questions and want to stop me or we pause for questions or at the end, um, we'll have a section where you can just ask me anything. Um, so let's get started. So first, uh, what is CoCalc? Uh, that's CoCalc's the main thing that this talk is about. Though I'll brush on a number of other things, um, but it's uh, a basically a website and a software project that I started, motivated by work teaching and doing research over the years since um, the late '90s. And the actual um, CoCalc application. Uh, is a combination of Jupyter Notebooks, SageMath worksheets, a LaTeX editor, um, a Linux terminal, and uh, there's capabilities involving a whiteboard and slides. And there's a lot of other things in there as well. Um, and everything in CoCalc supports real-time collaboration. So you can have multiple people editing um, a LaTeX document or a notebook or whatever at the same time, similar to Google Docs. And uh, one other thing that you don't see so much in other packages is there's an integrated course management system inside of CoCalc, which basically solves the problem of you have an assignment, you want to push it out to all your students, have them work on it. Uh, while they're working on it, you want to make it easy for them to ask for help and have you be able to pop in and see exactly what they're doing in real time, chat with them back and forth, possibly edit their work. Uh, give them feedback, and then collect their assignment, grade it, return it to them. And there's some other things thrown in, like peer grading and um, automatic grading and so on. So um, I'm currently using the slide mode in CoCalc right now in order to present this. And one of the things you can do in the slideshow mode is use uh, Jupyter Notebook cells and this is an example of, um, I'm using the SageMath kernel to run code directly in the slides. So if I go here and then I click the run button, it's going to run this Sage code and draw a plot. And you, know, you can change it, make it do weird, crazy things and you know see what happens. And in case you don't know what the current year looks like, it's to a number theorist seven times 17 squared. And you can also, you know, do other things like um, some. This should give an error. I think some of unless you pull it back. What? Oh, uh, well, I'll just leave this off for now. We can come back to that. But you can explore things interactively in your slides. Um, here's computing a random prime number, and I set proof equals false because it's a bit slow if to provably determine whether a number is prime, but you can do it um, without proof very quickly. Okay, so here's a little background about where CoCalc came from. Uh, so I went to, as was just mentioned, to Berkeley in the late 90s. And when I was there, I um, used the web a lot. And uh, my office mate, when he got, uh, this guy, Wayne Whitney, got he was you know, like the ultimate office mate. So he carpeted our office, painted it, put up a beautiful clock, got a couch. I don't know, you, you guys always, if you go to grad school, there's always somebody like that. And then when he finished all of those things, um, he helped me get a grant for some powerful computers. Um, one of them was named Shimura after that mathematician. And then the other one, we came up with a Japanese sounding name, Yomama, for the other computer. <laughs> um, so, we used those computers and I computed a large number of online tables related to number theory. And I created these online calculators so people could go to a website, type in some uh, question about modular forms or you know numbers and get some sort of answers. And uh, it, was, it was pretty fun. It was all just C++ code basically and, and these scripts that would run on the server. Um, I then uh, graduated and I went to teach at Harvard for five years. And when I was there, I made these additional, like more powerful online calculators built on top of Perry, which is a, um, a number theory, a very nice, powerful, but relatively small and self-contained number theory program, and Magma, which is a big arithmetic geometry group theory uh, package. 
So I made these really cool online calculators so that students could try out uh, homework problems and they wouldn't have to install the software. They could just play around in their web browser. Um, and then uh, near the end of this, I was extremely impressed by how easy it was for my students to play around with Perry and Magma in their browsers. And you know, it was working really well. And then um, maybe it was becoming a little too popular. So the uh, director of Magma, John Cannon in Sydney sent me a letter saying, your permission to use Magma. Um, well, he he kind of threatened me and said that I wouldn't necessarily have permission to use Magma in order to provide a web page. So I had made a little calculator that you could type Magma code into, and then it would show the output. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, what he ended up doing was saying I couldn't run that, but he was going to run a similar thing from a computer in Sydney. In any case, this made me nervous and worried. And so I started looking into options for creating something similar to Magma, but completely open source and free. Magma is closed source and not free. Um, so then that's why I started Sage and when I started it. Um, and then I moved to UC San Diego and then University of Washington and worked a lot on Sage with lots and lots and lots of undergrad students. And one of the things that we did was write a Mathematica-like um, notebook interface but we didn't want to write like a normal desktop application because it was a lot of work and it would only work on you know one operating system and we'd have to write it again for another operating system and i don't know it just seemed very painful um and so instead we wrote a web application that was similar to mathematica's notebook interface and um, by we i mean me and two undergrad or two students alex Bemishaw and, and tom boothby and uh this was like right after Google Maps came out and Gmail came out. You kind of, there was this whole idea you can make um, these big single page web applications that were interactive rather than every time you click, you get a page refresh. And so it was extremely painful figuring out how to do that in 2006, um, to put it mildly. And like how things worked in, I think Firefox was completely, totally different than how it worked in Internet Explorer and Opera. And it was just, it was really, really painful. jQuery didn't even exist. Um, it was just, it was hard, but we we persisted. One of the students had just worked in industry, so he had a lot of experience, which was really helpful. Um, so that was really a long time ago, but it worked. You could run code. And um, over the years, we put an enormous amount of work into this notebook, but it always felt like a big distraction from just working on core um, mathematics software like Sage. And the Jupyter project came out with a notebook that worked and looked almost identical to what we had built in 2011. We were really excited about it because it was written using much more modern techniques. And um, that meant we didn't have to work on the Sage notebook anymore, didn't want to. And so we kind of deprecated our notebook and switched over to Jupyter. And it's funny because it seems so modern at the time, but now it's like within a month or two, I think it's going to be totally deprecated. Um, and they have a new thing called Jupyter Lab, which replaces their, their notebook from 2011 and is even more modern. Uh, in any case, uh, I thought that was really cool, but I taught a bunch of classes at UW um, to undergraduates. They're kind of, it was before the term data science, but they're basically these data science classes, but with a lot of pure math mixed in. And I wanted the students to learn about statistics using R, learn the basics of law tech, you know, learn about group theory and calculus stuff using Sage, and, you know, do all these different things and do um, homework assignments where they could collaborate with each other and then write a, and put a lot of work into a final project. So like throughout the class, they would uh, design their project and at the very end, they would all present it. And um, it was really hard for them to install all the software necessary to do those topics on their own computers. It was kind of a, a nightmare. And so finally in 2014, um, sorry, in 2013, I spent a couple of weeks and I came up with a design where you could do all the things I just mentioned in um, a web browser. And I implemented a really rough version of it. Um, I missed an important Sage days and just like worked all day long every day for about two weeks to get this available for my class. And it really was like a whole design that goes um, beyond Jupyter Notebooks where you just have like type in some code, get output, type in some code, get output. You really want something more where you can use a terminal, more like you're a normal computer 
um, with a, a whole range of tasks, but in a way that's collaborative with other students. Um, so I launched that in 2013, you know, running on one computer in my office and using with my the students in my class using it. And then it got picked up a year later at UCLA in this absolutely ridiculously massive course with a thousand students. So that was a, a fun thing to support. Um, so it got used more and more over the years. And uh, a lot of people said they couldn't use it without a course management system that's built in. And so that got added, um, which really just solves the problem of distributing an assignment and collecting it and a few other things. But it's really important to have available. Otherwise you end up with like students constantly uploading and downloading files and it's just really tedious. Um, so finally, I decided to um, leave academia and work full time on CoCalc for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, one of them was just, you know, I remember one day I had to teach a class and CoCalc started getting attacked by some massive distributed denial of service attack. And I was sitting there in the class, CoCalc didn't work. I was really stressed because, you know, all over the world it was stopping for everybody. And I had to teach this class all at once. And it just was, it just seemed like a really stressful combination of factors. Um, so I ended up deciding, I tried to balance both academia and uh, running CoCalc, but you know, it's just not enough time. And there's a lot of tricky intellectual property issues with, you know, writing software that um, could potentially be financially valuable um, and working at it for another employer at the same time. Um, and also just having enough time. University of Washington was as accommodating as possible, but there's only so much they could do. Um, so I started a company and um, well, I started it technically in 2016, but I left uh, my job at the university in 2019 and worked full time on the company. So uh, that's that's where CoCal comes from. And um, the, the one little thing that I kind of skipped over is that uh, I I really, really wanted to work on lots of math software all the time and um, not web development, but uh, the web development type stuff to build CoCalc just seemed necessary. Also, I got really frustrated with finding funding for working on open source software. And so I hope that by building something that um, would benefit a lot from open source math software that I could later fund it, fund such work and ended up just kind of building this in the hopes that it would provide resources that could fund open source math software. That hasn't happened as much as I would like yet. It's been helpful, but maybe in the future, or definitely in the future, it's just taking longer than expected. Okay, so oh, along the way, I read some books, um, it's just a few seconds, but um, these books all have bits of code in them um, that you can run online or by looking at the book. And um, one of them, this last book on the Riemann hypothesis with Barry Mazur, we wrote this entirely in CoCalc uh, collaboratively. So um, it was a good test that you could work on a document with many images and 150 pages or so uh, in one LaTeX editor. Okay, so the rest of the talk is just going to be kind of a guided tour showing you some things that you can do in CoCalc and then answering questions. Okay. So first, um, the slides. This is just another slide showing a slide and how you can, you know, interactively run code. Um, there's other things you can do, like uh, you can sketch. Like I'm just going to kind of doodle a little. Um, you can uh, move things around. You can, you can see these are formulas that involve LaTeX. So um, we're about to change. Maybe I'll change this to G. But you can see that you see the formula down here and you can edit it up here. And uh, you can edit anything just by, you can move things around. You can click to edit and type. And it's all like a graphical editor. Um, okay, so those are slides. Next, uh, here's what a Jupyter notebook looks like in CoCalc. And um, I'll come back to mention a few of the features that they have, but let me just click on this. And uh, here we are, we're in the same notebook that we were just looking at, but this is live. And um, let's just use it to 
So the idea is you can write code, hit shift enter, and then see the output. And you can just interactively do this. You, instead of having to write a big program in a file and then run it somewhere, um, it's a much more interactive input output type of experience. And then you can also annotate the code that you're using um, by writing little messages like, let's factor some numbers. You know, and maybe we could add a little like, um, could pop up, a, put a little emoji there. I mean, just you can do little things like that. Um, and uh, here you can see what factorizations like, you know, be prepared. When is the next prime number year? 2027. If you learn nothing else from today's talk, at least you'll know that the next prime year is 2027, which is not the most prime looking number, is it? <laughs> um, but yeah. Let's see, here's an example that shows implicit plotting. This is all using the Sage Math kernel in um, a Jupyter notebook, but there are many other kernels. Uh, for example, there's Octave, which is very similar to MATLAB, but open source. There's a number of different Python distributions and uh, there's R, if you wanna use R code here, there's Julia, et cetera. Um, pretty much any major like interactive program you can think of, there's some Jupyter kernel for working with that program. And these are the ones that are pre-installed inside of CoCalc. And so just for fun, we could, you know, change this implicit plot. Like I'll just do something kind of silly, like change that to cosine squared and then hit shift enter, and then it will redraw the plot and who knows what's gonna happen, but there it is. So it sort of draws that. Um, here's some other examples of working with things in Sage. This is creating a ring of periodic numbers and then writing down the periodic expansion or the seven attic expansion of one half. So it's some like kind of non-trivial number theory. Um, and here's an example of computing the kernel of a matrix. So let me, let me show, you can define a matrix over the rational numbers and then ask for the kernel and it will give you back a vector space object along with the basis for it. So it structures things in a very similar way to how you talk about them in a linear algebra class. So instead of thinking, you know, how do you do something with a matrix? You can just say, I like the kernel of this matrix and it gives you back that as an object. And then you can do things like, is an element in that kernel? What's the dimension of this kernel? Given uh, two vector spaces, you can ask for their intersection um, and, and the sum of the two spaces. So that's the way Sage works. It just, it um, reflects the way you think about things algebraically. So that's a little demo of Sage and a Jupyter Notebook. All right, I'm going to pause for questions. And I'm you, also you looking at to, the chat. Do you have to import anything? Uh, to use Sage, no. Um, for the most part, no. Although there are some libraries, like let's say you wanted to use NumPy from within Sage, then you do import NumPy. And now you um, have you know, like NumPy available. Um, Sage itself, well, it's probably going to be pretty big. Uh, the Sage itself, yeah, that's huge. Um, I'll do dir numpy. Sage itself has a large number of things available at the top level, kind of similar to Mathematica um, in that regard, or Magma. Uh, and I think one way you could see that is if you do sage.all.tab, which it'll load like two or 3,000 things that are what are available at the top level in Sage. Um, so that said, you can use Sage as a library from Python itself, and then you have to import Sage explicitly. So I will illustrate that by making a new notebook, or yeah, I'll make a new notebook, Sage from Python. So this is how you make something new in CoCalc. Uh, you get a, there are various types of documents that you can create. There's actually, you can edit almost any type of file you can imagine. Um, but I'll make a Jupyter notebook. And then I'll make the kernel be um, the Python that comes with Sage. And so this doesn't have any of the Sage stuff we're using. This should be an error because the factor fun function has not been explicitly imported. And in a second, when Sage starts, you'll see that this is an error. 
And then what I'll do is I'll import Sage explicitly via import Sage.all. And then once that runs, um, I'll do Sage.all.factor. And at that point, it'll work. So now I'm waiting for all of Sage to import and make a factor. So this illustrates using, this illustrates um, the extent to which uh, Sage is just a Python library, like any other Python library, like NumPy or SciPy or something. It's just a very, very large Python library with like 5 million lines of code or something ridiculous total if you include all the dependencies and so on. Um, but one of the, there, there are various things we do in Sage. So in Python, if you're used to law tech, you might, or Mathematica or a lot of systems, you might find this a little bit disconcerting. Um, in Python, exponentiation is um, double asterisked, and this is, this is exclusive or. Um, if you switch back, I'm going to click to switch back to the Jupyter notebook I was looking at before, which is using the Sage kernel. There's this Sage right there. If we use this Jupyter kernel, go all the way to the bottom, two to the power of three is eight. And that's because in Sage, there are a small number of changes that are made to Python to make it more mathematician friendly. Um, so that's what's going on there. Was that a good idea or not? Unclear. Um, but that's what we did. There's pros and cons. Okay, uh, next question. Maybe I can ask a question. Uh, I noticed that you have also as a language uh, C++. What does it mean? You can write C++ code and run it? I mean, yes, it absolutely. Uh, sorry for asking. Can I download mm -hmm. this program or I have to use it on a line? Great question. So our question is, can you download this or do you have to use it online? And um, I'll say the answer to every question about can you download it is yes. Um, and to be clear, so for first Sage Math, which is the program I started in 2004, which is this, there's their website. This is a large open source program that lets you do a wide range of mathematics. This is freely available, open source, and you can download it via this link right here. Um, Jupyter Notebooks, there's a, you know, a whole website devoted to them, and there's tons of ways to download and install Jupyter. And uh, there's hundreds of these Jupyter kernels for things like C++ and so on, which you can get from various places. And then in addition to all of that, um, if you want CoCalc itself, so this program with real-time collaboration and um, our version of notebooks and a whole bunch of kernels pre-installed and so on, you can get it from cocalc-docker. And what you do is you install a program called Docker, and then you type this one line in, and it will download cocalc with a lot of stuff pre-installed and run it on your computer locally. So those are some of your options. Must the machine uh, be sorry results? for that. Uh, could you please send me the links, if you sure. don't mind? Um, I will put them right here in the chat that you guys should all have access to. Thank you. Ah. By the way, if one can use it to write a book, I imagine one can use it to write a PhD thesis. To yes. It would be, it's really, so one thing I haven't shown you at all is this is all collaborative. And let me um, try to illustrate that. So I'll just go to the original notebook. Um, I'm going to open another copy. Let's see, right here in another browser window. It's, it's a little tricky because I have to make sure that you can see both browser windows. Let's see. Can you guys see? I'm not sure what you're seeing, but do you see two windows kind of overlapping? We do. Or do you? Okay, excellent. So, um, so notice uh, here, let's see. Remember, I computed two to the power of three. And just I'm just trying to illustrate um, 
real-time collaboration. So you could see that when I type in this one, it changes this one. And you know, you have a cursor for both people, uh, et cetera. I mean, it's not too exciting because they're both just me and a different browser on the same desktop. But um, the idea is that you can have multiple people. And there's also a chat on the side. So um, I can type a message right here, like uh, what is two to the power? And you can use LaTeX in the chats. And oh, what? Oh, I need to hit space to turn it a lot. Yeah, it, it auto formats when you hit the space bar. So, um, so yeah, the answer is kind of big. Or how do I compute the um, square root of two? So like the student might ask, ask you something like that, and then you can answer it over here. Um, and uh, yeah, I should uh, show you LaTeX in a second as well. But uh, this is illustrating how you have real-time collaboration. Um, there's one other feature that's built on the real-time collaboration I'll just mention briefly before showing you LaTeX, which is this button time travel and um, Oh, and then Blake is another person uh, who works for CoCalc and is in this video chat right now. He just made a little um, chat right here as well. So when you click the time travel button, you get the same notebook that we were just looking at, but you get a little slider across the top and you can drag it and you see exactly what the notebook looked like as it evolved over time, as you can see. So notice like as I type this stuff, that's all recorded. And you don't have to do anything. Like there's no like, I want to save this revision or, um, you know, like what, what happened? You just like drag the slider and it shows exactly what happened. And it's very high resolution. Like every two seconds or so it records what you're doing as long as you've made a change. And it says who's making the change. So notice it says that Blake, um, you can see his name at the top. Blake is making the change. He's typing this in. Um, you can also click changes, and then that will give you a range slider. So you give two points in time, and then it will tell you exactly what changed from one point in time to the other one. And um, exactly this functionality works for every doc type of document you would work with in CoCalc. Um, it's showing, so like it's showing that I typed in squared n squared of two right there. And you can kind of step through and see how things have evolved over time. You can also look at multiple points of the same document. It's kind of like Emacs, if you've used that or something where you, or VS Code, where you can split the screen and, you know, you can look at this thing we did up here. And at the same time, the stuff that's going down, going on down at the bottom. So that's very convenient. And there's also a table of contents you can click on to easily navigate and a bunch of other things. Okay, so uh, the next thing I wanna show you is the LaTeX editor, which is right here. Um, so I just have a little example, LaTeX. Okay, so this is a file called LaTeX.tech. CoCalc has a full LaTeX editor. It's very similar to what you would use on your desktop. Um, and you can you can see the files that you're working with. Um, you can edit a LaTeX file, and you can see a preview on the other side. Double click, and it will take you back to the code you were working on. Um, you can be looking at some code somewhere, and then um, let's see. There's a sync button right here, and that will take you to the corresponding part in the preview. Uh, you can use any of a whole bunch of different ed uh, engines like PDF LaTeX, XE LaTeX. Lua Tech, et cetera. Um, some of these are better than others, for example, for dealing with uh, Unicode or um, certain extension packages and so on. And one cool thing that we um, nicely integrate with our LaTeX editor that requires no setup at all is Sage Tech. So all you have to do is type use package Sage Tech and similarly Python Tech for just running general Python code. And you can um, uh, type Basically, you just say, you just have this new magic command called backslash sage that gets added to LaTeX. And what it does is it lets you evaluate any code and the 
LaTeX representation of its output will appear in your document automatically. So uh, just to kind of show you how it works live, I'll change this to 2025. And um, when I build it, you'll see in a moment, it's a little work because it has to start up Sage and run it and then uh, get the output for anything that changed and then put it in the document. And you can see right here, it's it says running Sage Tech. It ran Sage and then it updated over here on the far right. And now instead of 2023, it says, it's still up. Uh, it's still showing the output for 2025. Maybe I have to run this one more time to get the fully updated version. Uh, okay, there it is. That's the updated version. And now it has that 2025 is three to the fourth times five squared. And then you can see some other things. You can also draw plots and do quite a bit using Sage Tech. Um, there's a really long manual if you just uh, Google Sage Tech where you can see how to do all of these things. You can run a block of code, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's other things like there's a little table of contents that automatically appears where you can click and it, what it did is it parsed the section headers in the LaTeX document and then, um, you know, lets you jump to those easily. And you can, there's also code folding so you can fold a section if you want and so on. And, I could, and of course, you're all thinking that's just copying Overleaf because Overleaf also has a web-based editor that does a lot of this. Um, but I'll have you know that I figured out many of these things before Overleaf uh, or ShareLawTech did them. It's just that they put a lot more effort into, a lot more effort into popularizing LawTech on the web than we did. So a lot of, there were a number of features that we had first, but um, Overleaf for LawTech editing tends to be a lot more popular for various reasons. Um, though I think technically ours is mostly superior to theirs and much more affordable, I'll say. Um, and also like it's really powerful being able to run arbitrary Python and Sage uh, along with your LaTeX document, which is a pretty complicated thing to implement. Uh, and moreover, you can use a Jupyter notebook to you know, output data and then just use that data in your LaTeX document really seamlessly it's all going on in the same place um, in this file system that you can just browse around and upload and download files to. So um, you get like more transparency and you can have several different tech files next to each other that are different parts of your uh, big document or, or just unrelated to each other, but they're all kind of friendly and um, you can work with them together in the same way that you would on your desktop. So any questions about the LaTeX editor in CoCalc? Which again, following the CoCalc Docker thing I um, pointed to above, you can just download this and install it on your own computer as well, or run it on your own server. Can I just uh, ask a quick question and follow up on the previous question? Please. Uh, uh, just, uh... You, you said earlier to uh, one of the person who asked the question that uh, it was open source freely available. Yes. And then you just said uh, like uh, a second ago that uh, it's uh, cheaper than uh, overly. So yep. I'm lost a little bit. So can you elaborate a little bit? Sure. Um, so his question is, how can I say something's cheaper if everything's open source and free, which makes absolutely no sense. And let me clarify. So um, both CoCalc and Overleaf, uh, you can download and run either of those on your own computer, but it's often a pain in the butt to just download and run them on your own computer, especially if you want to work collaboratively with somebody else. And because then you have to spin up a server somewhere and make sure they can access it. So um, both CoCalc and Overleaf have a website where you can make an account and then um, use the software that way, purely through the web. So, um, and again, both CoCalc and Overleaf have a business model where, because they're companies uh, where you can pay for improvements to the service. So um, for example, I think with Overleaf, you have to pay them if you wanna have more than maybe N collaborators where N might be three, but I can't remember. Um, so there's like things that get unlocked. Like, is it two? I yeah. believe it's three. So in Overleaf, if you want to have more than two collaborators, you have to pay Overleaf. And in CoCalc, 
TokCalc we allow an unlimited number of collaborators for free, but there are other things you pay for, like um, the ability to use Git to pull and push to remote repositories, um, and generally know, um, be able to have uh, access to the external network from within your project. Like maybe you want to download data sets as part of running a LaTeX document or a Jupyter notebook, and uh, that's something that you would have to pay for in CoCalc because mainly because free users would exploit that to um, attack other computers. So we make, we require payment for that. So there's just various things. And we also like give you more CPU resources if you pay. Um, but the, the price for CoCalc starts at about $3 a month for one project, which can have any number of users. So I think our pricing is pretty good. Um, or at least pretty competitive with overleaf's pricing. Um, okay, so any other questions about the LaTeX editor or anything I've said so far that you're just curious about? Okay, so let me show you what else. Um, I'm gonna return to my slides. Okay, so this is just a picture of the LaTeX editor and um, the things I showed you. One note, the, um, which I think is pretty cool, the LaTeX editor has this time travel feature as well, just like the uh, Jupyter notebook that I showed you. Everything has the time travel feature. And the point is that you can click the time travel button and right next to your LaTeX document, you can see what the LaTeX document was like uh, 20 hours ago, eight minutes ago, or whatever. And for LaTeX, this can be really, really helpful. Um, you don't have to do anything to save the changes. It's every few seconds that it saves them. It keeps the changes forever. And it solves the following problem. I don't know if you've ever used LaTeX and you somehow you mess up your document and it won't compile. Has it ever happened to you? And you have no idea where in this 30 page document exactly, you like put one stupid brace and LaTeX just says there's an error and it's it's super frustrating. And I don't know, I saw this a lot when I was trying to teach my students LaTeX or using LaTeX. I'd walk around the room and they'd be like, everything was working perfectly five minutes ago. And I have no idea what was going on five minutes ago. So with um, this time travel feature, you can very easily revert your document to how it was five minutes ago. You just click this revert button. And now notice that's back to 2023. I've reverted the document, it works again. So if you, you know, you're, you really need this document to get um, to work again, and you know it worked five minutes ago, you can easily go back to exactly when it worked and then click a button and boom, your uh, document will compile again. So it's a really, really nice feature to have, I think. May I ask a question <clears throat> about Please. actually CPU usage? So this uh, CoCalc is very useful for uh, developing a project, but uh, I guess after you have the code and if it is heavy and it requires a week run, probably you should run it somewhere else, correct? Or so, yeah. yeah his, so um, the person who just asked me a question's question is, what if you develop some code, like you're playing around in a notebook, you get something working nicely, and then you realize it should, it's something that's going to take a week uh, to run and you want, you know, maybe you need a lot of memory. So uh, we do provide uh, upgrades that are much more powerful in our store. So there's a place you can go and there's a little store and in the store you can, for example, buy a licensed booster or just an upgrade to your project. And what these do is they let you um, choose, hey, I'd like, yes, I understand. Um, I would like uh, 10 gigabytes of RAM and two CPUs and beyond what I already have. And uh, I guess I need some more disk space. And so then, and I'm going to want to have this for the next, um, the next week. So it starts today and I want to go for one week. And so um, I almost maxed it out uh, and that's the business one. So you, get it, you guys would all get the academic discount, which is 40% off. So I would pay $3 um, for that upgrade for the next week. And then I would apply that license to my project 
and it would have all these extra upgrades and they would last it would last for eight days so that's one option but um you'll notice that that may or may not be enough for what you need 10 gigabytes is not really that much um and maybe you need you know a lot more cpus we have another thing which is dedicated virtual machines so you could say i'd like a dedicated virtual machine um and uh, i wanted to uh, oh wait, actually i selected disk i want virtual machine sorry so you can ask for a dedicated virtual me machine for the next week and I, I really need some serious resources. So I need uh, 126 gigabytes of memory. And uh, there you can see this costs a lot more, but you know it's 16 cores, 126 gigs of RAM for the next eight days. And you can add that to your cart. And then your project, when you apply the license that you just got, your project will then run on this machine. So you can do that. Um, that's another option. Or you could just download Sage or CoCalc on whatever you know, nice machine you have in your office or wherever, and then run your calculation there. Or um, yeah, or you could run a machine in the cloud. So these CoCalc itself runs on Google Cloud, and so we're just running a machine there, and then um, per, we're doing all the management and installation, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oops. Uh, okay. So returning to the slideshow. Um, oh yeah, so I've just been showing you how CoCalc works, but I'm just gonna step back for a second. Um, this is what CoCalc looks like when you sign in and look at your projects. And I have a lot of projects because I've been using CoCalc for a while. Um, so here's what it looks like when you have, notice how tiny my little scroll bar is. I'm scrolling through my like, you know, 2000 or more projects I'm a collaborator on. So they kind of add up over the, over the years. <laughs> um, yeah, so going back 10 years, this is the very first class I taught using CoCalc in spring of 2013. And I haven't touched it in 10 years, but there it is. Um, one thing about CoCalc, which your students will like a lot, is they'll make um, an account for a class and it sticks around forever. So their accounts don't just like, they don't just lose access to all their work from a class unless they explicitly uh, delete it or you know ask for everything to be deleted. Um, if the default is that they can come back a year later and fully log in and look at or work with anything they did during your class or two years later or even 10 years later. So everything, unless it's deleted, which you can totally do, will stick around long-term. So that's the projects and then an individual project. You can have several opened at once, but here's um, a project devoted to some talks. And then there's a directory right here called uh, Today Howard. And then in there, these are the files for the uh, the talk that I've been you know, giving. And there could be a few extra files that are displayed. It's just like a normal operating system. Actually, it literally is an operating system. Here's a terminal, um, you can type top, it's just running, uh, let's see, Ubuntu 2204. Um, we actually, for stability purposes, there are several different versions of Ubuntu and several different images. Um, so like exact software stacks that you can run and you can explicitly select from them. That's done over here. Um, so you might uh, be teaching a class and you can set it so that all the projects for all the different students in the class are all fixed at um, the software stack on August 17th, 2022. And so you can fix things like maybe just before the semester or quarter starts and ensure that our upgrades don't break anything in your class, which you know it can be nice for stability purposes. Um, yeah, so it's like a it's a full-on operating system. Like you can use Vim directly in the terminal or Emacs if you like for some reason. Emacs can take a little while to start, even in 2023. Okay, there it is. I remember in 1993 being annoyed by how long Emacs took to start. So it's funny, even in 2023, it's a big program. Um, there's also the ability to run graphical applications. So uh, let's see. 
So this is, there's an X11 um, graphical desktop server that's built into CoCalc. So this is just a tab like any of the other ones that you can switch to, and you can even see it with multiple different people. So this is another um, browser. And I just started up a LibreOffice 7.3 running um, their spreadsheet program, which should appear in a moment. Um, and here it is. And so this is like a little spreadsheet where you can type stuff. And I mean, it's a pretty powerful spreadsheet because it's open office. Um, as you can see, and there's a lot of other programs that we have. So, but you know, it can be the handy, like, stuff Google. is uh, shared. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, it is shared. Although there's only one mouse because it really is X11, but oh, well, yeah. multiple people can look at the graphics simultaneously and interact with them. But um, it's not like it's you know it's collaborative in that you can both edit, but you can't literally simultaneously both. It's kind of like screen sharing or um, where you have two people that are both using a remote screen share. Yes. So, yeah. So this, I hope, illustrates that. So you can see that they're both looking at the same graphical desktop simultaneously. Um, this is mainly useful if you have some like obscure program or something that pops up a window and displays some graphics or some, you know, like like Octave, for example. You can you can run Octave in the terminal and then you can do plot. I'll just do something dumb. Um, plot a random 10 by 10 matrix and it pop, pops up the plot as a graphic and then you see it right there. And instead of just being like, instead of coming to the point where um, a graphic might pop up and thinking, okay, I need to figure out how to draw this as an image because I'm using a web browser and then somehow look at that image, it just works and it gets you past annoying problems that may come up. Okay. Um, and yeah, you can also SSH into a project. You can um, copy files back and forth. Uh, we, we also offer a number of other servers that will run from your project. So if you're used to using, say, VS Code or the Pluto, Pluto's a notebook for working with uh, Julia, um, Jupyter Lab is a very nice, modern, um, very open source uh, Jupyter project. Uh, then you can use those things as well. So here I just opened uh, VS Code, and then I can look at this directory um, that we were just working with, and then I can select a file and open it in VS Code, like maybe the tech file. Uh, or actually, uh, yeah, I'll just open the tech file. Um, okay, so now I, I've opened exactly the same file that we were just looking at, uh, the LaTeX file, but in VS Code. And this is running again from the same project. It just pops up another tab and lets you use Microsoft's VS Code instead to uh, work with your project. And you can even, you know, like run a terminal that way and do things. Um, yeah, I'll just click this really quickly. And I've pretty much shown you everything I wanted to show you at this point. Um, Jupyter Lab will pop up in about three seconds, and then I'll just finish up. Come on, Jupyter Lab. Yeah, there it is. Uh, and it's it's really important having these multiple different types of uh, software available. Like you'll find there are certain extensions that are you know really maybe take advantage of Jupyter Labs functionality and don't work in CoCalc. And so this gives you a way of still using those extensions easily. And so that, that's sort of, it's an important um, capability to have. And, you know, VS Code has extremely powerful debugging uh, functionality um, source. It tells you about code you're writing, if it's really complicated, et cetera. So it's really valuable having these as well, in addition to the core of CoCalc. Okay, so let me just kind of, uh, wind things up. So um, any other questions? I've given you a tour of CoCalc, told you what the motivation is, where it comes from, and hopefully given a sense of, you know, what it is, how it fits into the general world of software. 
and how you can use it either in a web application or on your own computer. So now if you have any other questions, ask them, but I probably have exhausted my time as well. Well, we are at the end, but definitely if you have questions, please ask. And But let's thank um, the speaker for uh, this very, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you so much. So yeah, I see, ah, yes, <laughs> they are applauses, yeah. Thank you. But uh, is there any question left? Anybody? So I have a question. Um, yeah, thank you for this presentation. Um, my question is, um, you know, offer leave is, uh, we, we use it a lot and uh, I think there's a lot of similarity between this and that. But um, do you have any cooperation with uh, universities that uh, allow uh, students to use um, the software as, you know, uh, not paying for the membership of that? So I think your question was about, um, do we have like site license agreements with universities? You know, like with single sign-on, that sort of thing? Yeah. Is that your question? Uh, yeah, there are, a, there are a number of departments um, or schools that buy, you know, pretty large co-calc licenses. Um, so, so yes, um, we also have, we've just started rolling out single sign-on for universities, like um, just to give you like a little glimpse of what that looks like. Um, Hey, hey, William, maybe mention the uh, anonymous, the ability to create an anonymous account or to use CoCalc for free. Yeah. As well. yeah, okay. So two things. One, um, there are some institutional single sign-ons. So DePaul University is our first like big one doing that. And you can see more about that here. Uh, the second thing is anybody can just go to the CoCalc website and click this button, try now, or right at the top, try. And then... See how it says use CoCalc anonymously and you click that big blue button, which I just did. It doesn't ask you anything at all about who you are or what you're doing, or it doesn't, doesn't, there's nothing. It just, you're now using CoCalc anonymously and you can then click your projects and it's sign it, um, in a second will show me my, the ability to make my first project. So I'll just call this test and I create a project. This is in an incognito window. I haven't in any way actually signed up yet. And it's now starting up my first project. Um, maybe I have to click the button, which says start project. Okay, so now it is starting. And then in a second, I will make a LaTeX document. Okay, there we are. Create and then say LaTeX document. And I'm now using um, LaTeX in CoCalc. I haven't given CoCalc any personal information or anything at all. Um, and like every day, like 2,000 new people sign up via this sort of anonymous method. And then, you know, if you find you're finding it really useful, if you don't want to lose your work, because obviously, if we have uh, no idea who you are or anything about you or any password or anything, there is an issue that could, you could very easily do some work in CoCalc and then just lose it. Like, there's no way to even know where it was. Um, so then you can just click this button, sign up, and it transitions your anonymous use of CoCalc. You just agree to the terms of service, optionally put in a name, and then you can just say, click Google or GitHub or whatever, and then you'll be signed up using your single sign on there, or you can actually make up your own email address and password if you wanna log in that way. Um, and then it just transitions your anonymous use of CoCalc to be via an account. So just pointing that out. Um, and the accounts are free until you decide to upgrade them. Yep. I mean, you can always do something for free. It's just that um, uh, upgrading is better because it works much better. And could you just maybe quickly go over the limitations of the free, you know, version just because of what's oh, the possibilities and limitations like what's possible and what's not possible 
Sure. So the question is, what are the limitations of the free version versus when you pay? So um, the compute resources you get are more limited in the free version. We basically take all of the free users and put them in one bin and everybody else in a different bin. And the free users get a smaller bin. By bin, I mean a collection of servers. So you just start competing for uh, limited resources. With a, you're in a much more crowded city competing for limited resources when you're using CoCalc for free. We also block all outgoing network traffic. So like if you go right here and make a terminal and then try to launch a distributed or try to launch a denial of service attack somehow from your terminal on somebody else, it's not going to work. You can't make any outgoing network connections. Why? Because we didn't used to do that and people started launching attacks. So there are problems. Um, uh, are there any other limits? It's really just less resources and outgoing connections are blocked. Uh, you can have you can have an unlimited number of collaborators. Uh, it's pretty useful otherwise. Um, but you know, it's really nice to be able to make outgoing network connections. It's nice so we can trust you to do that. And it can be really annoying when the speed is really slow and it's completely unnecessary for it to be slow. So, and our prices are, as I mentioned, really good. Like if you if you just click on the store and then uh, look at how much it costs to um, upgrade, especially at the academic discounts, like $4 a month. So I said three before, but it's four. Oh, there are cheaper versions. So the, the student version is, I mean, there's just different variants on this um, budget there. That's $2. The budget version is $2 a month. So it's not super expensive. Oh, uh, one other thing, you can extend the time until a project automatically turns off. So if you, um, if you projects turn off, if you don't touch them for a certain amount of time and you can extend that by paying more. Uh, as long as you're actively using the project, it's, it will rarely shut down. But if you, if you leave it and don't touch it, then it will shut down automatically to save resources. Um, okay, so we, we don't block actual functionality, like the course management functionality, the like time travel functionality, that's all 100% there, even for free users. It's completely different than Overleaf, where they say two collaborators only, where they don't give you their analog of time travel unless you pay them for the um, upgraded version. But for, but we do, we don't, we do, we don't reduce the features. We just re reduce the cost to us, basically. Any other question? Well, okay. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was very, very interesting. Thank you. And thank you for actually building this. <laughs> You're very welcome. It's really really useful yeah 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 so yeah